beauty of our great outdoors across the USA. Hi there, come on in. Now before you freak out and think we put the wrong show on the air, let me explain. Last week we tried out a new format for Michigan Outdoors, one based on news and current events. Now this show is for well, what could become the second half hour each week in our program schedule. We'll call it Outdoor Digest and this will be a, a feature oriented show, one where we'll travel around the country see different things, won't be hooked up to current events. For example, this week, we're gonna go bass fishing. We're going to have a wildlife sketch from Alaska. We have a trophy book with a how-to slant and a great recipe, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's time for the pilot of Outdoor Digest. We're fishing a small 60-acre lake in southern Michigan, an unnamed lake because it's private and the landowners have had problems with trespassers. But like many ponds and potholes, it's great for bluegills and largemouth bass. Brian Gregory was the fellow who escorted us onto this lake. Lots of fish, he said, but no boat launching ramp. Even with four-wheel drive, you have to watch out for the soft shoreline. Bass pro Marty Weebelhouse from Westland joined us, and he wins lots of bass fishing tournaments. So you fish all over the country, okay. bass fishing. Yeah, in uh, some of the BASS tournaments from uh, uh, Texas to southern Florida. Is it pretty boring up here after catching all them big hogs down there? No, not really. We've got some of the best bass fisheries right here in the state of Michigan right now. We've got, uh, I believe, Saginaw Bay and uh, Lake St. Clair are two of the best places for bass that you can go, and it's real close. What techniques do you use? You one of those southern worm fishermen? I use all, all kinds of techniques. I, I think it's better to, um, to know a variety of techniques instead of just trying to be good at one. I think if you can do, throw, catch fish on a spinnerbait, worms, jigging pigs, different uh, pitching and flipping, and all different kind of techniques, I think that's a key to it. So what about our Michigan anglers at this time of year, June, maybe getting into July? What, what types of techniques work best, or does it depend on the day? It depends on the day. It depends on the body of water that you're fishing. Uh, if you fish uh, in an inland lake, you're going to have a different technique than you will for, let's say, Lake St. Clair fishing in the river channels or, or Saginaw Bay. So, so give me an inland lake technique that you'd prefer. Um, I, like we've been doing today here with the rattlestick, I think that's one of the best uh, inland lake techniques I've ever had, and I use it on all my guide trips on inland lakes, and we catch a lot of fish. This is a rattlestick. It's a sub. It can be used as a surface bait, but I use it a lot as a subsurface bait. And um, what I do is cast it out and jerk it two or three feet down below the surface. And the lure, if you look up through the sun, I don't know if you can get it on a camera or not. It's a clear bait. It's translucent. You can see right through it, and it's got a little bit of a gold flash to it. It's my favorite color. It's a gold ghost color. And what you do is you cast the lure out. And you got to work with a system of jerking the rod tip on slack line, bouncing slack line, and reeling in line at the same time. And what that does is it makes, gives it an erratic retrieve under the surface for the lure. the lure. The lure goes back and forth like this through the water under the surface about two or three feet down. And the bass will just come up and just slam the lure. And it's a very, I'm, I catch a lot of fish on my guide trip, sometimes up to like 70 or 80 bass in a day using this bait. What would be like the rattlestick? A or similar, similar, similar yeah. lure, a rapala, um, a rattling rogue, um, a bomber, model A, things like that. It's a minnow type of lure. Is that your number one choice, a minnow lure like that? In this type of a lake, that's what I would use, yeah. This type of lake is my number one choice. Well, what about the spinnerbait? It's ideal for a lake like this. Well, we fished it this morning, and uh, we caught a lot more fish on this lure than we did with spinnerbaits. And it's not that a spinnerbait's a bad lure. I think that there's a time <laughs> and place for each one. It's like a tool. You know, you're going to hammer a, a nail with a hammer, not a screwdriver. But the spinnerbait is a good lure because it goes through a lot of weeds. And uh, this particular one here has got tandem blades on it. You notice it's got two different kind of blades. This willow leaf blade is one of the hottest baits right now in the, in the, in the uh, fishing circuit, in the uh, tournament circuit. And uh, because it gives off a lot of flash and not a lot of vibration, but a lot of flash. And uh, you notice the trailer I have on here too. I put a I put a split tail eel kind of a trailer on this, and uh, I always throw a spinner bait with 17 pound test line, and uh, because it seems like when you're throwing it in the weeds and you're throwing it around docks and things, you can get big fish on. You can lift them over the side of the boat, and they don't get away. And it's really effect. It's really important when you're fishing in a tournament. Just for fun fishing, you, you don't need to put 17 pound test line on. But I don't lose too many lures because I use it. Now one of the ways that to fish this lure is I usually cast this out 
and, and make a cast to the edge of the weeds and retrieve the lure to the edge of the weeds. And then as soon as it gets to the edge of the weeds, I drop it like this and give it total slack line. And when it does, it makes the lure flutter straight down off the edge of the drop off. Now, if you were to keep your line tight, instead of having the lure fall straight down off the drop off, the lure will come down on an angle away from the fish. The key to it is give it slack line, sometimes even push the button in on the reel and peel off line and let that lure fall straight down. And then you take in the slack line and you just, just start retrieving it real slow. It's just with the slow uh, reeling. If you don't get nothing in the first five or six casts, I usually reel it in and cast it out and do it again. It's a very effective way. I've won a lot of tournaments doing that, and you, I guarantee it'll catch you more fish. In tournaments, you don't use live bait because you want to throw all the fish back, right? Right. Uh, the fish have a tendency to, when you use live bait, to inhale the lure or inhale the, the bait or the minnow and want to really swallow it deep. And a lot of people gut hook fish that way. In tournaments, the fish hits now usually set the hook in the mouth, and you rarely get a fish that you really harm. What is the kick in tournament bass fishing? I mean, you're not used to playing the fish and watching it jump and laugh when it gets away because that could be money. Yeah, it's money. Uh, to me, the, the thrill of it is competition. I love the, the uh, competition and, and competing against other fishermen. And uh, it's the little things that count in a tournament to make the nitty-gritty. Losing that one fish that got away can cost you some money. Why, why are bass the ones that are the competition fish? Bass are, are probably the most versatile fish around. They, they are in little dinky ponds. They're in big, huge natural lakes. They're in the Great Lakes. They're everywhere. And they can survive in a, in a variety of types of water where fish like, like salmon or, let's say, walleyes or things like that, um, they can, they've got a limited area like, that they can, fit, they can stay in. Like this, this lake here that we're fishing in today, uh, you couldn't have salmon and, uh, and walleyes. They wouldn't survive. They wouldn't reproduce naturally. And bass really aren't very good to eat, the largemouth in particular. No, I, um, I will eat bass out of the clear bodies of water in the area, and uh, only I'll, I might keep maybe 10 a year, and that's all. I, really, I rarely do. If I want to eat fish, I'll go catch some walleyes or go out on a walleye charter or something and do that, or some nice panfish like the ones we caught today. Those are very good to eat. What do you mean the ones we caught today? Well, you did. I didn't catch any <laughs> panfish. <laughs> no. I was the one who used a little plastic grub to catch a good mess of gills and sunfish and crappies. I can't resist those panfish, so I caught most fish. They caught the biggest. Dwight Kittle from Shaftsburg hoists Bob Garner's four-pounder, the biggest bass of the day, the only one that we kept. I learned a lot from Marty Weeblehouse about competitive bass fishing, and I enjoyed watching them battle those leaping largemouths, one of the great aerial fish acts in Michigan outdoors. <laughs> When we're talking bass, we usually refer to either largemouth or smallmouth bass. And to catch each of them, anglers use slightly different techniques. Let's take a look at our 1990 Moosehead Fishing Awards data. It shows us that 18% of the largemouth trophies were caught on live bait, half of them crawlers, half of them minnows, while 82% were caught on artificial lures, mostly plastic worms, followed by spinnerbaits, crankbaits, surface lures, and jigging pigs. Now, smallmouth bass, on the other hand, were caught half on live bait, including minnows, leeches, and crayfish, and half on artificials, mainly crankbaits and jigs. Let's check out some of the big ones in our trophy book. Oh, that's a nice picture. A man with his 23-inch largemouth bass, Jim Black from Greenville, was casting a silver rapala in Tallman Lake, Montcalm County, just before dark. A gob of worms attracted this 20 and 3 quarter inch largemouth bass for Jack Springstead from Rockwood. Jose Lake in Iosco County, the fish weighed six and a half pounds. A Texas rig plastic worm took this 21 and a half inch largemouth. Al Joseph from Sanford pulled it from a Lapeer County farm pond. Another plastic worm enticed this largemouth bass from Gillette's Lake in Jackson County. It's unusually long, 24 and a half inches, but angler Fran Starzik from Lansing gave it a boost by holding it out close to the camera. <laughs> Makes an impressive picture. Well, it doesn't look like it, but this bass weighed more. It was a seven pounder, but it looks small because Brian Paquette from Bay City is so big. He caught it with a gob of worms on a single hook fishing a pond in Emmett County. Now this fish is 22 and a half inches long. Notice how small it appears compared to this 22 and a half inch smallmouth bass. Whoa, smaller angler, fish held closer to the camera, bingo, huge trophy. 
Nice coloration on that smallmouth caught by Bill Kemeny from Flat Rock Fishing Brevoort Lake, casting a homemade plastic crawfish jig. Crawfish, live or imitations are deadly on smallmouth bass. Wow, look at this picture. Great! Adam Laughlin from Williamston fished Mullet Lake. He also used a hair jig imitating a crayfish that this 20-inch smallmouth bass couldn't live without. With a crayfish imitating crankbait, Paul Boyle from Sheboygan noticed this or enticed this 21-inch smallmouth to bite. He was drifting in the Black River at 10 o'clock at night in late May, took this picture the next morning. Now never discount a crawler harness for smallmouth bass. John Dagaways from Escanaba caught this 20-incher near shore in a Lake Michigan Bay trolling. You can't get a cuter picture than a youngster with a big fish. Here's 10-year-old Jeremy Makins from Gross Eel. He was probably with his dad or grandpa drifting in Houghton County's Portage Lake. This 21-inch smallmouth bass grabbed the minnow and gave Jeremy a tussle. Oh, isn't she cute? Let's find out how three-year-old Lindsay Savio from Battle Creek caught this 23 and three-quarter inch trophy. How old were you when you caught this fish? Um, three. Three years old? And you caught a 23 and three-quarter inch largemouth bass? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, do you remember much about this fish? No. <laughs> it's a good thing you got it mounted, Dad. What was the story? Oh, we went out gill fishing, her first time fishing, and her first fish. And uh, the bobber went down, I yelled for her to set the hook, and she jerked, and it uh, made two runs, went down the weeds, and I kept telling her, reel it in, reel it in. She, I can't, I can't. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed a hold of the pole, and we got it out of the weeds, and she, she reeled it all in all by herself, and I netted it for her. <laughs> no kidding. That's terrific. Lindsay, you have quite a career ahead of you. Oh, what a doll. Three-year-old Lindsay Savio, our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Bass Angler of the Week. Oh, if I was just 42 years younger. Rule of thumb generally on bass is that plastic worms or worms uh, are good for largemouth bass. Smallmouth bass, you're going to want baits or lures that, that imitate crayfish. That's a rule of thumb anyway. You know, Bass fishermen rarely encounter bears while they're fishing, but black bears are often seen by trout fishermen in the northern parts of the country. You get way up north, that's where you come across the Alaskan grizzly bears, the ones with the big claws. These are the ones that scare people, and with good reason. With that introduction, let's head to Alaska and talk about bear watching. Osprey Island Lodge is located on the turquoise waters of Lake Clark, 150 miles west of Anchorage near Alaska's famous Bristol Bay salmon runs. During the month of July, the Alaskan brown bears feed on the migrating salmon that swim up the shallow rivers and creeks to spawn. Now, anglers often encounter the big brown bears. This smaller one a few minutes earlier tried to take some fish from our outfitter, Gary Pogany, who had flown upriver in his float plane. Just before you came around the corner, the bear, I came back because I lost my lure. And uh, the bear was already on the, the fishing tackle and uh, the bag with the fish in it. And right of course here. I was concerned about our yeah, fishing vest and uh, the fish is what he was after. And he didn't want to back off and, and I really didn't want to lose all our gear. <laughs> so How far it was sort of was a he? standoff. We got within about uh, 20 yards of each other, pretty close. He finally, uh, I finally, pushed a little bit forward and he decided to go the other way. He walked off slowly and turned around and came back a little bit. Were you, were you nervous? I, I, actually, I was. I didn't have any fire arm or anything. And it's huh. hard to swim with hip boots on. Yeah. So it is a little scary even to you who see bear. Uh, absolutely. You never know what they're going to do, especially the young ones. The bigger ones are pretty predictable. They uh, usually run off, but the, the small ones are hungry and uh, food uh. becomes a priority. Gary Pogany has a cautious attitude towards Alaskan brown bears, and he shares it with his fishermen customers by flying every fishing party into the famous Brooks River at Katmai National Park for a few hours of bear watching. The salmon don't have an easy time jumping waterfalls, so they congregate in the pools below. The bears have learned this long ago, so every July, brown bears convene on the brooks, as well as other rivers throughout the Alaskan coastal regions. Some bears are very adept at catching salmon, and some aren't. It seems to be an innate ability that either a bear has it or it doesn't. 
Some chase the salmon, some stand and watch before making a move. Some stand in the pools and wait for salmon to swim by their feet. The bears we're watching are called Alaskan brown bears. They're actually grizzlies that live near the coastal areas and during the summer feed on fish. That's the main distinction between a brown bear and a grizzly. The brown bear is larger, probably because of its fish diet that is abundant and widespread in Alaskan rivers in the summer. Now don't confuse these bears with teddy bears. Teddy bears don't move. These bears do, and they're extremely hostile towards one another. Bears of all species are solitary critters except for mating season. Otherwise, they're independent. And with brown bears, the only time they come together other than mating is during the salmon runs, and a mysterious truce is observed by most bears at this time. It's not a total truce. It's a tolerance during the salmon runs as long as other bears keep their distance. There's a distinct hierarchy of brown bear dominance. At the top of the ladder are the big males, the ones who do the mating, and size is the main factor. Second on the ladder is a sow bear, a female with cubs. A female with larger, older cubs takes precedent over a female with smaller cubs. It's obvious here that the bigger bear is driving the smaller one away. Then when an even larger bear, undoubtedly a big male, steps into the river, the second bear backs down. That's the pecking order. And the third on the ladder is a group of siblings, young bears that are weaned but still stick together. As a group, they have more clout than the lowest on the pecking order, the single, unattached males and females that aren't particularly large. These solitary bears take a beating from the rest of the bear world. Some of the big dominant males have particular pools they use for salmon fishing, and they use these same pools year after year, and all the other bears know it, stepping aside when the dominant Bruin appears. Competition for fishing territory and a violation of distance, just getting too close, are two main reasons for bear fights at this time of year. And any time two strange bears meet each other for the first time, a fight usually breaks out to establish dominance. This posturing happens constantly among bears, and they mean business. A few years ago, from this very viewing platform, horrified tourists watched a big boar bear chase and catch a cub, kill it, and start to eat it. Not exactly what these tourists came to photograph, but that's life in the world of bears, and it's rough. There's a 40% mortality of bear cubs during their first year, and the leading cause of death is probably big males looking for an easy meal. Alaskan brown bears on Kodiak Island are about the same size as polar bears, upwards of 1,500 pounds. The only mammal that grows larger would be an elephant, a rhino, or a hippopotamus. The hair trigger temper on a bear isn't appreciated enough by humans, though. Too many people think of bears as teddy bears, cute and cuddly. Well, they're cute all right, but hardly cuddly. Their strong jaws and teeth, complemented by those sharp claws, can tear a human apart in moments. There are probably 30 of us watching these bears from an elevated platform. Everybody's taking pictures. And you can see this bear's reaction as it spots another bear coming from a distance. With each bear, its comfort zone, its space that it needs around it varies. Bear attacks on humans used to be relatively common until the early 70s when the Park Service instituted strict camping and bear watching policies in Alaskan parks. Park rangers are assigned to monitor the bears and monitor the tourists all day long and keep them as far apart as possible. The trail that we all walked in on now has a brown bear sauntering through. I'll try and get back on the, the stairwell, please. Um, you know, a bigger bear would just go through and do his business. This guy has no place to go. Yeah, okay. This isn't a bear that's ready to attack, but if a human walked towards it, it could be. Please. Okay, Climb back on. on. There and save me back a space. On. 20 years ago, most bears wouldn't come this close to humans. Every year, the average distance gets closer, and people who don't realize the danger try to get close to the brown bears to take pictures. Park rangers say the next bear attack is only a matter of time. Well, here we are fishing many miles from the Brooks River. 
a relatively small Alaskan brown bear made a beeline for a group of anglers that were fishing and catching salmon right here a few moments before. I was reeling in a beautiful rainbow trout at the time, but that bear was interested in looking for salmon that those terrified anglers left behind, and sure enough, he found one. So why did these fishermen run for their float plane? Because no one can be sure when a bear will chase a human the way they chase each other. An old Alaskan guide once said, if you know what a bear is going to do next, then you know more than it does. Remember that, please. In our March-April edition of the Outdoor Digest magazine, I ran an article on the dangers of bear watching. The pictures here, the photos were all taken off of videotape from the feature you just saw. Now, I was planning on running that feature in March or April on Michigan Outdoors, but you know, I've got so many complaints from people saying, why don't you keep Michigan Outdoors in Michigan? That's part of the reason we developed the idea for this Outdoor Digest show. It would be on a different night of the week. It would contain feature material from North America all around. Michigan Outdoors would stay in Michigan and it would stay with current events. That's how those two shows would work together. Now, what about the recipe? Because we always run the recipes in here in full color. Well, we would have different recipes in Outdoor Digest, but they would all be in the Outdoor Digest magazine. So we'd have twice as many recipes, twice as much material each week. That gives us an hour of outdoor programming, which a lot of you have asked for. Now, this week, for example, here on Outdoor Digest, we're running a bass fishing, fishing feature, so it's only logical that we run a recipe on bass. Tim Major apparently catches a lot of bass because he sent us another recipe called bass with blue cheese sauce. And I think this cheese sauce is really what makes this recipe. Uh, bass isn't my favorite, and there you can see it's got, if you cut that out, the lateral line out, you wouldn't have hardly well, any filet left. It has a lot of dark meat on it, yep. and that's one thing that makes bass strong, whether it's largemouth bass. Smallmouth bass is in a different category, but largemouth bass or white bass in particular taste a little stronger. Right. You're going to make a sauce out of flour and sour cream and, of course, blue cheese, and you add just a little bit of wine to this. White yeah, wine? Right. And um, I think that that flavor is going to come through just a little bit. But, you know, this is, this is really brilliant to take the <laughs> strongest type of salad dressing you can get. Right, you know, and put on a strong, strong fish. Put on a strong fish <laughs> to see what happens. Right. And then this just goes in the oven just for a little bit, and that's all there is to this recipe. Well, the recipe is real simple. Mm -hmm. and who to try this out? Well, I wanted to introduce my daughter to the show. Tara Trost, 18 years old. Isn't she good looking? <laughs> yes. She sure is. But we wanted to see how she liked this bass with blue cheese. It tastes just like blue cheese. I mean, it doesn't, I thought it would be like just a little bit tinge of it, but that's what it tastes like. It's so, pretty, nothing totally exotic. I mean, it's simple tasting. But what about the fish? Does the fish taste fishy? Does it, mm -mm. do you like the texture of the fish? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think she just found a bone. Oh, she got a bone. <laughs> the bones go well with the blue cheese, too. <laughs> it's a small bone, evidently. She's still, she's still chasing it around in there. <laughs> but all in all, I am amazed. It's a little bit salty from the blue cheese. Just from the blue cheese, because there's no added salt. Okay, well, this is the test. After she got rid of the bone, is she going to go in for more? <laughs> I don't think it's too salty, personally. Don't you? Oh, really? Uh-uh. Hmm. It's very tasty, though. It is. Mm -hmm. a great way to fix bass. Even if you give bass a D, the sauce, you'll give an A. An overall bass and blue cheese is a winner. Well, that wraps up our pilot show for Outdoor Digest, as we propose to do it for Michigan and the rest of the country. It's a program that has material from all over North America. A lot of in-the-field production, wildlife sketches, a little different than our fast-paced, current events-oriented Michigan outdoors. But we'd like to have a whole hour each week, two different shows. We'll find out real quick from the Michigan PBS Network whether this is going to be possible. In the meantime, you keep in mind that both shows have the same message. You know what it is. Get outdoors this weekend if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week.
Next week, we'll be back with Michigan Outdoors in this time slot. Our fishing feature will either be bass or trout, depending on how we do tomorrow. We'll have an SOS Bureau report where we reveal what we learned through our Freedom of Information Act request for DNR records on block and crop damage permits. In one word, I'd call this show a blockbuster. Don't miss it right here on Public TV. 